Now open your question paper and look at part one. Part one. You will hear three different extracts. For questions one to six, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract one. You hear part of an interview with an environmental campaigner called Richard Frost. Now look at questions one and two. Richard, can you give us an example of what people in other countries are doing in terms of recycling? Absolutely.、Um, well, sixty tons of plastic packaging are dumped on the streets of Accra, the capital city of Ghana, every day. But recently, a businessman called Kwabena Ose Bonsu set up a company called Trashy Bags to do something about it. He pays people to collect plastic bags, and these are stitched together to make new ones. This kind of venture should be sponsored by governments, and there are plenty of similar projects occurring in other countries if they need ideas. But Kwabena had decided he wasn't going to wait around. He says he wanted to come up with an idea that would sort out this awful situation in his lifetime. That's fantastic. What about here, though? I suppose you'd like to stop the use of plastic bags in supermarkets completely. Well, yes. They are an absolute environmental disaster, but I can't see our government going as far as banning them. I know that some supermarkets are charging customers five or ten pence per bag, but such a small charge doesn't put most people off. Actually, you can get bags made of bamboo or other fabrics, but only a minority of people are using them. So I'd say it's up to the supermarkets to start promoting them a bit more actively, so that customers know they're available to buy instead. Richard, can you give us an example of what people in other countries are doing in terms of recycling? Absolutely.、Um, well, sixty tons of plastic packaging are dumped on the streets of Accra, the capital city of Ghana, every day. But recently, a businessman called Kwabena Ose Bonsu set up a company called Trashy Bags to do something about it. He pays people to collect plastic bags, and these are stitched together to make new ones. This kind of venture should be sponsored by governments, and there are plenty of similar projects occurring in other countries if they need ideas. But Kwabena had decided he wasn't going to wait around. He says he wanted to come up with an idea that would sort out this awful situation in his lifetime. That's fantastic. What about here, though? I suppose you'd like to stop the use of plastic bags in supermarkets completely. Well, yes. They are an absolute environmental disaster, but I can't see our government going as far as banning them. I know that some supermarkets are charging customers five or ten pence per bag, but such a small charge doesn't put most people off. Actually, you can get bags made of bamboo or other fabrics, but only a minority of people are using them. So I'd say it's up to the supermarkets to start promoting them a bit more actively, so that customers know they're available to buy instead. Extract two. You hear two people on a radio program talking about the subject of hypnotherapy. Now look at questions three and four. You've just had a few sessions of hypnotherapy, haven't you? I have to say, I didn't think you were into that kind of thing.、Mm, you thought I was the sceptical type. Well, I've never been a believer in most alternative therapies, but I've always been fairly open-minded when it comes to hypnotherapy, at least when it came to dealing with psychological problems. I mean, before I experienced hypnotism for myself, I didn't think it would work for actual physical symptoms. I went along because I wanted to quit smoking, 
But Dr. Gray helped me overcome my back pain too.、Ah, I guess a lot of people see celebrity hypnotists on TV embarrassing people they've hypnotized, making them do ridiculous things. And I think the result of that is that people are put off going to see genuine hypnotherapists because they think anyone who practices hypnotism is not trustworthy.、Mm-hmm. I think you're right, but people should know that hypnotherapy is a serious profession, and if the idea of being under someone else's control makes you nervous, I can tell you it's not like that. You're always aware of what's going on. You've just had a few sessions of hypnotherapy, haven't you? I have to say, I didn't think you were into that kind of thing.、Mm, you thought I was the sceptical type. Well, I've never been a believer in most alternative therapies, but I've always been fairly open-minded when it comes to hypnotherapy, at least when it came to dealing with psychological problems. I mean, before I experienced hypnotism for myself, I didn't think it would work for actual physical symptoms. I went along because I wanted to quit smoking, but Dr. Gray helped me overcome my back pain too.、Ah, I guess a lot of people see celebrity hypnotists on TV embarrassing people they've hypnotized, making them do ridiculous things, and I think the result of that is that people are put off going to see genuine hypnotherapists. Because they think anyone who practices hypnotism is not trustworthy.、Mm-hmm. I think you're right, but people should know that hypnotherapy is a serious profession, and if the idea of being under someone else's control makes you nervous, I can tell you it's not like that. You're always aware of what's going on. Extract three. You hear part of an interview with a woman called Fiona. Who works as a zoo tour guide? Now look at questions five and six. Um, Fiona, how is it working with visitors to the zoo? The public. Oh, generally, they're fantastic. Maybe they're a little bit quiet to start with because they're not sure what they're going to do. But soon after we've met the rhinos or we've started doing the monkeys, they normally open up and they're all, "Oh, this is fantastic!" <laughs> they start asking questions and they know a lot about the animals anyway because they've been going to the zoo for years. But the hardest thing for me is being constantly alert to the risks because even though you do warn people about them, they just don't realise what could happen. I mean, even the cheetahs look so docile and so cuddly. Have you ever had an incident yourself? No, not exactly. But I did get a bit too close to the bars of the chimpanzee enclosure once, and the chimps had branches with them to try and get food from beyond the bars. And one of the male chimps basically just reached through the bars with his branch and poked me in the ribs, and it was basically a "get back, that's my food." <laughs> <laughs> and from that moment on, I've always been doubly aware of how close I am to an animal and what tools it has to get to me as well. <laughs> he could have been a lot nastier though than he was. It was just a warning. Um, Fiona, how is it working with visitors to the zoo? The public, oh, generally, they're fantastic. Maybe they're a little bit quiet to start with because they're not sure what they're going to do. But soon after we've met the rhinos or we've started doing the monkeys, they normally open up and they're all, "Oh, this is fantastic!" <laughs> they start asking questions and they know a lot about the animals anyway because they've been going to the zoo for years. But the hardest thing for me is being constantly alert to the risks because even though you do warn people about them, they just don't realise what could happen. I mean, even the cheetahs look so docile and so cuddly. Have you ever had an incident yourself? No, not exactly. But I did get a bit too close to the bars of the chimpanzee enclosure once, and the chimps had branches with them to try and get food from beyond the bars. 
and one of the male chimps basically just reached through the bars with his branch and poked me in the ribs, and it was basically a "get back, that's my food." <laughs> <laughs> and from that moment on, I've always been doubly aware of how close I am to an animal and what tools it has to get to me as well. <laughs> he could have been a lot nastier though than he was. It was just a warning. That's the end of part one. Now turn to part two. Part two. You will hear a museum curator called Frank Turner giving a talk about a dinosaur exhibition. For questions seven to fourteen, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have forty-five seconds to look at part two. I've been working in the museum for,、uh, well, it's almost twenty years now, and I can tell you that people come along for many different reasons. For some visitors, it's the desire for knowledge. For others, they just want to be amused on a rainy day. But with the dinosaurs, it's less about being entertained and more to do with plain old fear. They like to feel scared, and there's nothing like a thirty-foot monster towering over your head to do that, regardless of your age. Obviously, we get a lot of children coming with their families or school groups. There's a life-size model of a T-Rex that the museum got a few years ago. That certainly holds their attention when it starts moving. But the priority for the kids when they arrive at the exhibition are the interactive displays. They seek those out first, which is maybe not surprising, because that's the sort of way they learn nowadays. Anyway, I do think that the exhibition can help with certain aspects of a child's development, even if dinosaurs aren't really their favourite subject at school. It's my opinion that you require imagination to appreciate an exhibition like this. You have to be able to fill in the missing pieces for yourself, and that's what this exhibition encourages. It's something that often gets neglected in mainstream education. There's just a focus on reading skills and understanding what's in print in front of you, which isn't much of a challenge, is it? The challenge for scientists, and this is something I often have to explain to visitors, is that they simply don't have all the information they need yet. In general, if a research team is lucky enough to find some fossilized bones of a dinosaur, they won't find a whole skeleton, just part of it. So sometimes there's not much to go on. There's a lot of speculation involved when they're figuring out what it looked like, how it moved. You see, the fossilization process requires particular conditions. The creature needs to be buried quickly. Then gradual sedimentation needs to occur, and the body has to lie undisturbed. That's why the environments in which fossils are generally discovered tend to be marine ones rather than geographical areas that have remained comparatively dry, like deserts. One of the challenges of showing a dinosaur exhibition is that you need to keep up with new theories and decide which ones are credible. Some interesting findings have come out of China in the last decade, which I'll explain in a moment. It's still generally accepted in the scientific community that dinosaurs disappeared following the event of a giant meteor crashing into Earth, which led to significant climate change. But not all dinosaurs succumbed to the cold. It was an enormous volcanic eruption that wiped out many of these creatures in China. They were instantly buried alive. And thus preserved, 
because there was no oxygen to help in the process of decay. And what interests scientists the most about the Chinese dinosaurs is that they appear to have been covered in feathers. It is possible that these were used for display or defence, but the general opinion is, and I'd have to go along with it, is that they were used for insulation. Bird feathers have all these functions too, of course, but whether birds have directly descended from dinosaurs is still a matter of great debate. I have to admit that I am rather proud of the exhibition, and the feedback we receive is always positive. But there's even more we could do to make it a better experience for visitors, and for this reason, their donations are always welcome. In fact, the recent discoveries in China mean that some of our displays will need adapting so that the appearance. I've been working in the museum for, ah,、uh, well, it's almost twenty years now. And I can tell you that people come along for many different reasons. For some visitors, it's the desire for knowledge. For others, they just want to be amused on a rainy day. But with the dinosaurs, it's less about being entertained and more to do with plain old fear. They like to feel scared, and there's nothing like a thirty-foot monster towering over your head to do that, regardless of your age. Obviously, we get a lot of children coming with their families or school groups. There's a life-size model of a T-Rex that the museum got a few years ago. That certainly holds their attention when it starts moving. But the priority for the kids when they arrive at the exhibition are the interactive displays. They seek those out first, which is maybe not surprising because that's the sort of way they learn nowadays. Anyway. I do think that the exhibition can help with certain aspects of a child's development, even if dinosaurs aren't really their favourite subject at school. It's my opinion that you require imagination to appreciate an exhibition like this. You have to be able to fill in the missing pieces for yourself, and that's what this exhibition encourages. It's something that often gets neglected in mainstream education. There's just a focus on reading skills and understanding what's in print in front of you, which isn't much of a challenge, is it? The challenge for scientists, and this is something I often have to explain to visitors, is that they simply don't have all the information they need yet. In general, if a research team is lucky enough to find some fossilized bones of a dinosaur, they won't find a whole skeleton. Just part of it, so sometimes there's not much to go on. There's a lot of speculation involved when they're figuring out what it looked like, how it moved. You see, the fossilization process requires particular conditions. The creature needs to be buried quickly, then gradual sedimentation needs to occur, and the body has to lie undisturbed. That's why the environments in which fossils are generally discovered tend to be marine ones rather than geographical areas that have remained comparatively dry, like deserts. One of the challenges of showing a dinosaur exhibition is that you need to keep up with new theories and decide which ones are credible. Some interesting findings have come out of China in the last decade, which I'll explain in a moment. It's still generally accepted in the scientific community that dinosaurs disappeared following the event of a giant meteor crashing into Earth, which led to significant climate change. But not all dinosaurs succumbed to the cold. It was an enormous volcanic eruption that wiped out many of these creatures in China. They were instantly buried alive and thus preserved, because there was no oxygen to help in the process of decay. And what interests scientists the most about the Chinese dinosaurs is that they appear to have been covered in feathers. It is possible that these were used for display or defence, but the general opinion is, and I'd have to go along with it, is that they were used for insulation. Bird feathers have all these functions too, of course, but. Whether birds have directly descended from dinosaurs is still a matter of great debate. I have to admit 
that I am rather proud of the exhibition, and the feedback we receive is always positive. But there's even more we could do to make it a better experience for visitors, and for this reason, their donations are always welcome. In fact, the recent discoveries in China mean that some of our displays will need adapting so that the appearance. That's the end of part two. Now turn to part three. Part three. You will hear part of a radio interview in which a naval officer called Peter Martin is talking about his experience. For questions fifteen to twenty, choose the answer A, B, C, or D, which fits best according to what you hear. You now have seventy seconds to look at part three. As you may have observed from its recent television campaign, the Navy is keen to recruit young men and women. With us today, we have Chief Petty Officer Peter Martin, who has kindly agreed to share some of his experiences with us. Peter, what was behind your decision to join the Navy? Well, it goes back to where I came from. I knew there were better opportunities out there compared to what was in my hometown. There was nothing there for me except a lifetime of unemployment and messing about. I joined the army, and whilst in the army, I bumped into a navy guy, and I asked him, "You know, how long have you been in the navy?" He said,、uh, "Just two years." And I said, "Where have you been?" He said, "All over the world." And yeah, I liked the sound of that. The navy was for me. In the army, the only option I had ahead of me was a few months in Singapore, so it was an easy decision to transfer, and I've never regretted it. Was the transition easy? I mean, from the army to the navy? Oh yeah. Once I was in, well, the difference between the army and the navy is the discipline. It's a,、uh, how shall I say? It's that the training in the army is intensive. I did the basic training in the navy. I found it a breeze. I could do that with my eyes closed. However, I did have a hard mother, and discipline was what she was all about. If you're raising six boys and they're all competing for your attention, that's how it has to be. <laughs> But it wasn't just about obeying orders. It was about leadership. What I mean by that is that my mother led from the front, always showed us by example how to behave, and that's how you do it in the navy. So yeah, my mother set us on the right track in that respect, and so the transition to the navy was easy. You know, at one stage I was managing a hundred and ten people when I was、uh, a petty officer, and I managed that amazingly well. I thought I'd get myself into trouble, but no, it went well. So you adapted. But what about the new recruits? How do they find it? Well, some of these new recruits plan on coming for a good time, not a long time.、Mm. When I joined, I walked in and said, "This is me for twenty years." These guys, they can't handle leaving home. That security,、uh, adjusting to a structured military organisation where rules and regulations are put on them, and taking care of themselves. A big thing when you're coming from school. Mum used to do your washing and your ironing, all that stuff. So a lot of these kids come and don't even have these skills. So I think it's important for、um, kids leaving school and, and thinking seriously ab about the military. They need to be aware that life in the navy is about self-discipline, and that they're going to have to adjust to that. If you can achieve that, you'll do well. 
The other big factor they should remember is that you get friends for life, whether you like it or not. Basically, it's the camaraderie that keeps you going at times. And when you go back to your hometown, what kind of a reaction do you get from people when you go back home? Yeah, well, I think it's more jealousy. A lot of them can't see past the front gate. I mean, they've got no desire to find out what's going on in the world beyond the edge of town, and that's all my generation I'm talking about.、Mm. However, the older people down there welcome you in for a cup of tea to talk about where you've been, what you've done, what you've achieved, and just、uh, because they've never been anywhere else either. But they're curious. I was the unusual one. I was the only one from my year. I think I was the first one from my actual town to join the military. If I'd stayed there, it would just have been a matter of time before I ended up the same way as my old mates. Pretty aimless, really. So when I go home, it、uh, reminds me of how far I've come, everything I've accomplished, and I get a lot of self-satisfaction out of that. To be honest,、mm. how do you think the public perceive the navy? It's generally naivety. All they hear is how much money we're pumping into this and that. When things have gone wrong, guys having accidents, they only see what the media feeds them, and a lot of people see that it's not wartime. So why do we need a navy? I think more publicity is going to help. We've just done a documentary on the officer training school. More stuff like that would be beneficial to the navy, such as boardings. It would be good to document a boarding when the navy goes aboard illegal fishing vessels in our own waters, or deals with smugglers in international waters, stopping drugs getting into the country. That kind of stuff should be in the public eye, so they know we're doing a good job.、Mm. And what about life after the navy? Can the navy prepare you for returning to civilian life? Yeah, definitely. I'll give you an example. My mate Brendan, we joined together. He was in the navy for ten years with the naval police, and then he left and went into a position with the customs service, a border control detective. The requirements for that position were that you had a master's degree, but he went in there with just his basic skills from the navy, and he got selected against five hundred people that applied, and they all had university qualifications. You name it, they had it. But the skills that he attained from the naval police were exactly in line with what they wanted. The guys from university had limited ability in communication and leadership, but the customs people were confident he had everything they required, and that's why the application was successful. I think this kind of thing is something else that makes the navy a good prospect for young people who want to. As you may have observed from its recent television campaign, the Navy is keen to recruit young men and women. With us today, we have Chief Petty Officer Peter Martin, who has kindly agreed to share some of his experiences with us. Peter, what was behind your decision to join the Navy? Well, it goes back to where I came from. I knew there were better opportunities out there compared to what was in my hometown. There was nothing there for me except a lifetime of unemployment and messing about. I joined the army, and whilst in the army, I bumped into a navy guy, and I asked him, you know, how long have you been in the navy? He said,、uh, just two years, and I said, where have you been? He said, all over the world, and yeah, I liked the sound of that. The navy was for me. In the army, the only option I had ahead of me was a few months in Singapore, so it was an easy decision to transfer, and I've never regretted it. Was the transition easy? I mean, from the army to the navy? Oh yeah. Once I was in, well, the difference between the army and the navy is the discipline. It's a,、uh, how shall I say? It's that the training in the army is intensive. I did the basic training in the navy. I found it a breeze. I could do that with my eyes closed. However, I did have a hard mother, and discipline was what she was all about. If you're raising six boys and they're all competing for your attention, that's how it has to be. <laughs> But it wasn't just about obeying orders. It was about leadership. What I mean by that is that my mother led from the front, always showed us by example how to behave, and that's how you do it in the navy. So yeah, my mother set us on the right track in that respect, and so the transition to the navy was easy. You know, at one stage I was managing a hundred and ten people when I was、uh, a petty officer, and I managed that amazingly well. I thought I'd get myself into trouble, but no, it went well. So you adapted. But what about the new recruits? How do they find it? Well, some of these new recruits plan on coming for a good time, not a long time.、Mm. 
When I joined, I walked in and said, "This is me for twenty years." These guys, they can't handle leaving home. That security,、uh, adjusting to a structured military organization where rules and regulations are put on them, and taking care of themselves. A big thing when you're coming from school. Mum used to do your washing and your ironing, all that stuff. So a lot of these kids come and don't even have these skills. So I think it's important for、um, kids leaving school and, and thinking seriously ab- about the military. They need to be aware that life in the navy is about self-discipline, and that they're going to have to adjust to that. If you can achieve that, you'll do well. The other big factor they should remember is that you get friends for life, whether you like it or not. Basically, it's the camaraderie that keeps you going at times. And when you go back to your hometown, what kind of a reaction do you get from people when you go back home? Yeah, well, I think it's more jealousy. A lot of them can't see past the front gate. I mean, they've got no desire to find out what's going on in the world beyond the edge of town, and that's all my generation I'm talking about.、Mm. However, the older people down there welcome you in for a cup of tea to talk about where you've been, what you've done, what you've achieved, and just、uh, because they've never been anywhere else either. But they're curious. I was the unusual one. I was the only one from my year. I think I was the first one from my actual town to join the military. If I'd stayed there, it would just have been a matter of time before I ended up the same way as my old mates. Pretty aimless, really. So when I go home, it、uh, reminds me of how far I've come, everything I've accomplished, and I get a lot of self-satisfaction out of that. To be honest,、mm. how do you think the public perceive the navy? It's generally naivety. All they hear is how much money we're pumping into this and that. When things have gone wrong, guys having accidents, they only see what the media feeds them, and a lot of people see that it's not wartime. So why do we need a navy? I think more publicity is going to help. We've just done a documentary on the officer training school. More stuff like that would be beneficial to the navy, such as boardings. It would be good to document a boarding when the navy goes aboard illegal fishing vessels in our own waters, or deals with smugglers in international waters, stopping drugs getting into the country. That kind of stuff should be in the public eye, so they know we're doing a good job.、Mm. And what about life after the navy? Can the navy prepare you for returning to civilian life? Yeah, definitely. I'll give you an example. My mate Brendan, we joined together. He was in the navy for ten years with the naval police, and then he left and went into a position with the customs service, a border control detective. The requirements for that position were that you had a master's degree, but he went in there with just his basic skills from the navy, and he got selected against five hundred people that applied, and they all had university qualifications. You name it, they had it. But the skills that he attained from the naval police were exactly in line with what they wanted. The guys from university had limited ability in communication and leadership, but the customs people were confident he had everything they required, and that's why the application was successful. I think this kind of thing is something else that makes the navy a good prospect for young people who want to. That's the end of part three. Now turn. To part four. Part four. You will hear five short extracts in which various people are talking about embarrassing situations. Look at task one. For questions twenty-one to twenty-five, choose from the list A to H the person who is speaking. Now look at task two. For questions twenty-six to thirty. Choose from the list A to H the situation the speaker finds embarrassing. While you listen, you must complete both tasks. You now have forty-five seconds to look at part four.
Speaker One. The thing I hate, and I always used to get myself into this situation. Fortunately, I've got a strategy now. But when I'm supposed to be showing foreign clients round, I can never remember names. My mind just goes blank. It's pretty poor, really. I mean, it doesn't exactly come across as professional, does it? I'm supposed to be setting an example to the junior members of staff, but I'd find myself saying things like, "Have you met?" and hoped people would get on with it themselves. Then my assistant actually suggested I rehearse the whole thing with her beforehand. So that's what I do now. We actually role play the whole thing. <laughs> I'd be lost without her. Speaker two. Well, I'm not exactly the maternal type. Maybe that's got something to do with it. They come along, and I'm setting up the equipment, and they're beaming with pride. And of course, you're expected to make all the right noises and comments. But it's not really me. I often can't tell which are boys and which are girls. And recently, I've found myself in this situation a couple of times. I managed to come out with、uh, what's his name then, or have you got a name yet for? And then my voice just trails off, and I, I just hide behind the lens. And they've noticed, of course. They feel offended, and they're paying money to have their kid's portrait taken. It's not exactly good for business or personal recommendations. Speaker three. I don't have much self-confidence in general, but I really feel exposed when we go out to eat after work. It's usually the others who decide because you know I've just started in our department, and I haven't been in the area long either, and it's always somewhere posh and foreign. I usually get one of them to order, or I just say the same, so I don't have to repeat it. I wish I'd studied foreign languages at school. They all seem to know exactly what they're ordering, or they pretend they do. I think I'm going to get a phrase book, one that shows you the meaning and the pronunciation nice and clearly. I'm fed up with them all looking down on me. It makes me feel really small at times. Speaker four. I didn't spend a lot of time there. A couple of terms, I think. My father was working as a foreign correspondent, so we were always relocating. But I was in the same dormitory as Peter Haywood, and we got on from the absolute start. Really nice guy, Peter, and we've always kept in contact. It was his idea. In fact, I think he organised the whole thing. I really didn't want to go. I knew exactly what it'd be like. But he went on and on, and eventually I gave in. And when I turned up, it was worse than I could possibly have imagined. Nobody had much to say to anybody, and the few conversations we had were utterly contrived. What do you expect after a gap of twenty odd years? Nothing in common, except most of us had ended up in banking, and everybody remembered hating the physics teacher. Speaker five. My brother was working on the island as a diving instructor. It's a good lifestyle. My grandmother was Greek and used to make us repeat certain phrases, but I can hardly remember a thing. So I flicked through this pocket dictionary on the way over just to have a few ideas. Anyway, my brother took me to meet some people, and I was speaking to one restaurant owner in English. But I thought it might make more of an impact if I could show I knew a bit of the language. I came out with a couple of phrases I'd memorized or thought I had. Obviously, not well enough, judging by his face. He just collapsed, laughing. I'm going out there again in a month's time and showing my CV around. At least my catering skills are all right. They should be after eight years in the job. But first, I'm going to get myself some private tuition. I mean, I want to be taken seriously. There won't be many people prepared to take me on unless I have some idea of the language. Speaker one. The thing I hate, and I always used to get myself into this situation. Fortunately, I've got a strategy now. But when I'm supposed to be showing foreign clients round, I can never remember names. My mind just goes blank.
It's pretty poor, really. I mean, it doesn't exactly come across as professional, does it? I'm supposed to be setting an example to the junior members of staff, but I'd find myself saying things like, Have you met? and hoped people would get on with it themselves. Then my assistant actually suggested I rehearse the whole thing with her beforehand, so that's what I do now. We actually role play the whole thing. <laughs> I'd be lost without her. Speaker 2. Well, I'm not exactly the maternal type. Maybe that's got something to do with it. They come along and I'm setting up the equipment and they're beaming with pride. And of course, you're expected to make all the right noises and comments. But it's not really me. I often can't tell which are boys and which are girls. And recently, I've found myself in this situation a couple of times. I managed to come out with, uh, what's his name then? Or have you got a name yet for... And then my voice just trails off and I, I just hide behind the lens. And they've noticed, of course. They feel offended and they're paying money to have their kid's portrait taken. It's not exactly good for business or personal recommendations. Speaker 3 I don't have much self-confidence in general, but I really feel exposed when we go out to eat after work. It's usually the others who decide because, you know, I've just started in our department and I haven't been in the area long either and it's always somewhere posh and foreign. I usually get one of them to order or I just say the same so I don't have to repeat it. I wish I'd studied foreign languages at school. They all seem to know exactly what they're ordering or they pretend they do. I think I'm going to get a phrase book, one that shows you the meaning and the pronunciation nice and clearly. I'm fed up with them all looking down on me. It makes me feel really small at times. Speaker 4 I didn't spend a lot of time there, a couple of terms, I think. My father was working as a foreign correspondent, so we were always relocating. But I was in the same dormitory as Peter Haywood, and we got on from the absolute start. Really nice guy, Peter. And we've always kept in contact. It was his idea. In fact, I think he organised the whole thing. I really didn't want to go. I knew exactly what it'd be like. But he went on and on, and eventually I gave in. And when I turned up, it was worse than I could possibly have imagined. Nobody had much to say to anybody, and the few conversations we had were utterly contrived. What do you expect after a gap of twenty-odd years? Nothing in common, except most of us had ended up in banking, and everybody remembered hating the physics teacher. Speaker 5 My brother was working on the island as a diving instructor. It's a good lifestyle. My grandmother was Greek and used to make us repeat certain phrases, but I can hardly remember a thing, so I flicked through this pocket dictionary on the way over just to have a few ideas. Anyway, my brother took me to meet some people and I was speaking to one restaurant owner in English, but I thought it might make more of an impact if I could show I knew a bit of the language. I came out with a couple of phrases I'd memorised or thought I had. Obviously not well enough, judging by his face. He just collapsed laughing. I'm going out there again in a month's time and showing my CV around. At least my catering skills are all right. They should be after eight years in the job. But first, I'm going to get myself some private tuition. I mean, I want to be taken seriously. There won't be many people prepared to take me on unless I have some idea of the language. That's the end of part four. There'll now be a pause of five minutes for you to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. Be sure to follow the numbering of all the questions. I'll remind you when there's one minute left so that you're sure to finish in time. 